Welcome to the panel on New World Slavery in the 1632 Timeline. Uh, my name is Bjorn Hassler. I'll be the moderator today. I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves, starting with Eric. A and please tell us uh, why you're on this panel. Uh, I wrote the first book in a series, so I, I sort of created it. Um, and I have authored or co-authored most of the novels, not all of them, but most of the novels that have followed. And I've been involved with things from day one. And I have over the 20 years since the book, actually I did the research and wrote the book 1632 in the summer of 1999. So for me, it's actually been 21 years. Uh, the book itself came out in uh, February of 2000. So that's why we're calling this the 20th anniversary. Um, and the issue of slavery in the new world is one that I have thought about pretty much that entire time close to it. So that's why I'm on. Walter? I'm Walter Hunt, uh, science fiction, historical fiction author. I've done now three novels with Eric, two in the 1632 universe and one outside of it, Council of Fire, which we were just talking about. Um, and I'm a historian by training and have done a lot of uh, research and reading. And I'm uh, co-author of the, the first real North American 1632 novel, uh, The Atlantic Encounter, 1636 The Atlantic Encounter, which uh, addresses that matter in part. So that's why I'm on. Now you know. Hey, Chuck. Um, so I'm Chuck Gannon, uh, and I'm surprised because uh, actually Robert was next on the screen. So I thought he. Yes, was. I know. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, what? Um, so at any rate, uh, Chuck Gannon in the 1632 universe, uh, I've done Papal Stakes and Vatican Sanction and Commander Cantrell in the West Indies and soon in November, it will be No Peace Beyond the Line and there's more behind that and then there are, I think I'm in two or three of the Ring of Fire collections, uh, first run collections and um, I'm probably most known for hard science fiction but right now this is what I'm known for. Uh, that's why I'm here, and a lot of this came about, the, the No Peace Beyond the Line, uh, to put it lightly, is, um, and even more so, excuse me, Calabar's War, which comes out in March, but I'll let Robert talk about that. Um, uh, uh, the, the issue of slavery in the New World, you can't be in the New World too long, particularly in the Caribbean or South America, and not talk about slavery. You might want to, but you can't because yeah. it's, it's the overwhelming reality of that, of that world at that time. Hey, Robert. All right. I am uh, Robert Waters. I have been writing in the uh, 1632 Universe series since 2011, I believe. Uh, a lot of stories in the Grantville Gazette. Many of them are collaborations with Mariah Crawford and Eric Brown. Eric and I have actually written some stories uh, set in the New World up in the colonies, um, uh, showcasing uh, Native American cultures around Rhode Island and Connecticut. Uh, uh, yeah, and the reason I'm on this panel is because, as Chuck said, uh, we have a novel coming out, I believe, in April, uh, 1636. Oh, you got I think it's, I think it's, it's April. April's what I was told. Yeah, yeah April. Uh, April, um, it's 1636 Calabar's War. And a good portion of that novel begins to address this issue of slavery in Brazil and in the Caribbean. Thank you all. And uh, Eric, could you set the framework for um, yeah. why, why and how the series is addressing slavery? Well, the issue wasn't addressed very much in um, the first novel, 1632. Um, that novel took place in Central Europe um, um, entirely. Um, there was no naval component in it in the first book at, at all. Um, and I wrote 1632 intending it to be a standalone novel. So, you know, it just, slavery just simply, in New World slavery just simply wasn't an issue in that book. But um, when we decided to turn it into a series, and I say we because it was to some degree a collective decision, 
uh, spurred by my publisher at the time, Jim Bain. Um, I had to start thinking about it because if, if you're going to do a series based on the premise of a modern, by modern, we're talking the year 2000, that was 20 years ago when the book was written. Um, a modern American coal mining town, especially one in West Virginia, which got its origins at the beginning of the Civil War when West Virginia seceded from Virginia. Um, there is no way that an American population, and, and particularly because in this case, there are a number of African Americans in the population, but leaving that aside, even if there weren't, there's no way that any American town isn't going to have an opinion on the issue of slavery in the year 2000. And that opinion is going to be extremely negative um, for a variety of reasons, not the least of which the bloodiest civil war or the bloodiest war in all of American history was fought over that issue. Um, but the issue then becomes, well, fine, they're against it. And the slave trade and, and new world slavery is still it's, it's not in its infancy, especially not in South and Central America in the Spanish uh, and Portuguese territories, but it's still early days, and particularly North America, it's just barely getting started. Uh, it, even in the Caribbean, it's gotten started, but it, it's nothing like um, what it became a century or two later. Um, and, and racial attitudes are, are not what they became a century, uh, century or two later either. Um, <laughs> Still, how does a initially quite beleaguered community of small town, we're talking 3,500 people, uh, perched in the middle of, of Europe in, in a part of what is now Germany that um, used to be the southern part of East Germany, if people aren't clear where Thuringia is, how would they possibly affect the slave trade and what's happening all the way across the Atlantic in the New World. Um, but nonetheless, they are starting to think about it, and particularly, in particular, the hero of the, if, insofar as there is a single hero of the ser series, or, there isn't really, but the closest is Mike Stearns. And he is, for the time being, in a position of great political power. And he's certainly thinking about it. And he's on record as stating he considers the two great evils of the world that, that were created largely out of this 17th century to be chattel slavery in the New World and the second serfdom in Eastern Europe. And he would very much like to dismantle both of them uh, in their infancy, so to speak. So that's the basic framework from which we approach this in the series. And it's taken a while to unfold because um, the new world is a long ways away from where everything started. Um, and the resources that the town of Granville, even with the political success they have and having been able to become part of this quite powerful United States of Europe, still it's, it's, it's a long ways away and affecting it's not going to be easy anyway. It's, it's complicated. There's all kinds of, of issues involved. So what we've started to do for some years now, but it's taken a while to build up, um, is starting to lay the basis for how our, our heroes and heroines, because there are more than one storyline in this series, as anyone knows who, who reads it and follows it, um, how do they start tackling the issue of new world slavery, given that they want to end it? before it becomes any more destructive than it already is. And, and, and when I say destructive, uh, the thing about chattel slavery in the new world was not just simply the, the negative impact, which is quite obvious that it had in all kinds of ways on the societies that emerged in the new world. It was, it was also disastrous uh, for Africa. Uh, it was an extremely disruptive period of at least two centuries where, where 
particularly in West Africa, to some degree in Angola, but particularly in West Africa, where uh, which which had historically always been the most developed and and uh, culturally and and economically and politically advanced part of Africa, you had the nations and kingdoms and tribes down by the coast suddenly becoming much more powerful than they had been traditionally, where the traditional powers in Africa had been in the inland, in the Sahel. Um, and all of a sudden they're very powerful because they're getting guns in exchange for slaves and they use the guns to raid in the interior and, and capture slaves and sell them and, and so forth. And that the, the, the disruptive impact that has on all the societies, including our own, um, in Africa was, was something that most people in the United States don't know very much about, but it was, it was, had a really negative bad impact on the development of Africa at the time. Yeah, I think it, it's fair to say though that the, uh, uh, that the uptimers have a, have a very simple, clear black and white view of, the, of a very, very complex subject. Yes, and, they do. And, the, and that they're going to have all kinds of unintended consequences if we have anything to say about it. Yeah. yeah. No, they, um, yeah, they, they don't do this in subtle terms. And, and, you know, regardless of whatever personal prejudices any one of the people who live in Grantham may have, and there's plenty of them who do, but that's not the same thing as not in the year 2000, having gone through the history of the United States of America, except for some real hardcore Neo-Confederates, pretty much everybody in the United States has a pretty hard-ass opinion on the Civil War. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, and what led up to it and, and, and getting rid of the Civil War. So, yeah, the Americans are going to have a pretty definite, clear-cut view, but the Europeans at the time don't necessarily have it. And what w we are trying to do is, is, because we're writing fiction, what we're trying to do as novelists and storytellers is tell stories that are plausible and, and make sense that depict in some dramatic way how they would go about trying to start combating this and unraveling. And it's taking a number of different avenues. The, uh, the books I've been doing with Chuck, uh, the first of which was Commander Cantrell in, in, in the West Indies, which came out some years, a few years ago, and then the sequel to it. When was it? 2014? 2014. Yeah. And the sequel to it, which is 1637, No Peace Beyond the Line, is coming out in November. a month from, from now, um, beginning in November. Um, that tackles it in, in what is in many ways the heart of it, which is in the Caribbean. Um, um, well, when I say the heart of it, 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 you can argue the heart of it's actually in, in, in Latin America, but the Caribbean's where all the Nexies come together. It's where the slaves are brought in. It's where the plantations are starting to emerge and so forth. And Chuck and I have been developing a line depicting the development of naval power of the USC and in particular of the Dutch. Um, <coughs> and this goes back to developments that were first depicted in the second novel of series 1633 where the Netherlands and particularly the, the seven colonies the seven Dutch colonies went through a big change in the history of what actually happened. Um, when the Spanish Cardinal Infante Don Fernando managed to successfully reunite the Netherlands under, well, not exactly under Spanish control, under his control. Um, and he's wearing a fig leaf because he is the younger son of the king, of, a younger brother of the king of Spain. But that's another complexity that the series takes up a great length. But what happens to the Dutch is also very important because what one of the strategies of the United States of Europe, which started Mike Stearns, and he's no longer directly in, in, in affecting it because he's now a military figure off in Eastern Europe. But his replacement, Ed Piazza, has the same view of things, um, is the United States of Europe, I need to back up. The United States of Europe itself is the single most powerful country in Europe now, but it, it is the one least involved in the new world. It has no colonies of its own there. Um, in real history, uh, the population is, is overwhelmingly at this point German, but in real history, a lot of Germans did emigrate to the new world, but not in this period. 
it was at a later period. Uh, people don't actually realize the, the United States of America, insofar as it has any single ethnic identity, it's actually more of a German nation than anything else. There's more actual German genetic heritage in the United States than any other nationality. The Irish come next and then Africans. Um, but that came much later, that came in the 19th century and later. Uh, in, in the 17th century, Central Europe just wasn't that involved in the new world. Um, so there's no direct involvement in the USC, but the Dutch do have, and they're starting to develop one, and in real history, the Dutch did become quite prominent in the slave trade. But in this timeline, things have taken a different turn, and I'm not going to say anything more about it, because I will let Chuck talk about that. The other side of, of the thing, which we are just beginning to bring in, and, and it really won't come in in a big way until the novel that, that Chuck and Robert wrote gets published in April, and that's 1636, Calabar's War. And that's the first novel in the series that really situates itself pretty much right smack in the middle of slavery. Um, and the characters are overwhelmingly down. I'm trying to think if there are any. There are no uptime characters with the exception of bridging scenes at the beginning and the end. We see Mike Stearns, we see Ed Piazza. Right. I, I don't even know if we go back to them. I can't recall now off the top of my head. I think we end on- We don't. It's yeah, basically no, all like downtimers. I mean, yeah. there's no significant number of Americans appear in it. Am I right about that, Robert? That, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. They, they, like Chuck said, they begin at, they start at the beginning, and then Eddie Cantrell makes an appearance at the end, uh, and that's it. Yeah. Right. But, yes, he does. And and just to make it very clear, uh, Eric said that this was the novel that, that Robert and I wrote. It's the novel that Robert wrote, and I occasionally passed my my hand over it and did some high <laughs> politics and, well and, and, and what well, ch chuck made sure i didn't sound stupid when it came to the naval aspects of the novel <laughs> which is something i'm but, a little less but, of, you know. it, the extent to which writer x writes portion <laughs> d of novel c in this series is very complex um, because the series as a whole is a kind of a joint enterprise. This, this is not by any means something I cook up all the ideas in my head and transmit them to people. There's ongoing discussions that, you know. Oh, we get to make up stuff from time to time. Yeah, no, Chuck and I have been kicking <laughs> stuff around for at least 10 years and Walter and I kick stuff around. Um, Virginia and I, God only knows how many years we've been kicking stuff around. Um, and then, However, yes, Colorbar's War was, 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 Robert was a predominant writer. Um, it, his name will not appear as a lead writer. Chuck's will, that's because of the um, uh, cold-blooded demands of marketing. It's just that <laughs> simple. No, I mean, it's just that simple. Um, what Robert and Chuck did was, was really for the first time put the reader right smack in the middle of this society. Now this is, is South American slavery. It's not quite the same as what an American audience is gonna be more accustomed to thinking of, but um, what is, as much as anything else, one of the things we wanted to do, uh, because if there's anything I particularly personally detest, it's any romanticization of, the South uh, during that period of history. Um, uh, Americans don't really quite grasp just how utterly hideous and brutal that whole system of chattel slavery and you know, African slavery in the New World was for centuries. It was just, it, it began with cold-blooded mass murder. Um, the middle, uh, it, first in the capture of the slaves, many obviously were killed in the process. Then in what's called the Middle Passage, which was a period where the slaves were shipped from Africa to the New World, that voyage took typically around six weeks. And very, very early on, the uh, slave traders discovered that the most profitable way to do it was to cram people into the holds of a ship as tightly as possible, uh, which created lethal conditions. Um, I mean, literally, people were just literally jam-packed next to each other for weeks. Um, nowhere to defecate, nowhere, you know, I mean, just, it was hideous. And about 10% of the cargoes that called it would die on the trip. 
and they knew that would happen. They didn't know which ones would die, but they didn't care. Um, and it's estimated by historians, the figures range from 2 million to 6 million, as how many people died in the Middle Passage. And then once they arrived in the New World, if they were unfortunate and got sold to one of the tropical plantations in the Caribbean and some on the coast, um, the standard policy was to just work them to death because it was more profitable to work a slave to death and buy a new one than it was to try to keep them alive. So again, nobody knows how many people died in that process. Um, so one of the things that, that we wanted to make sure happened, and I think Robert and Chuck did an excellent job of it, is just making clear to people, and, you know, without we didn't want to completely gross people out. You yeah, you don't want to get too gratuitous. Huh? You don't want people to actually just stop reading the book. So we sort of, we didn't gloss it over. We just sort of, there's no need to necessarily look right at it um, as long as people understand what's happening. But uh, I was very pleased with the way they did that with this book of just, just making clear. And by the way, I was also very pleased that in the course of it, uh, something that Chuck and I did in, in um, in our book, which is coming out in uh, uh, No Peace Beyond Line, is uh, I've also really detest the romanticization of pirates. Um, and, and, and so we, we demonstrated, you know, no, these were not jolly good old boys. No, no, these were a bunch of murderers, torturers, rapists. You know. yeah, this isn't Disney. There's a reason that if they got captured, they got hung. Uh, and and uh, so we make sure the reader understands that too. Uh, the Caribbean in this era was not a nice place. It really, <laughs> really wasn't. Um, and in the course of all this, what also comes up is uh, a lot of dealing with the Native Americans. Um, uh, that has that comes up. It's intermixed all through this. Yep. Um, it's it's intermixed in the book that Walter and I did that just came out in, in June, Atlantic Encounter. So you've got this 17th century is is really a dynamic century. Um, I don't can't say it, 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 there, there was a lot of brilliance in it. There was a lot of horror in it. Um, but a lot of our own history comes out of this period. It really does. I mean, it traces right back there. And, um, okay, I'm talking long enough. So um, um, I would actually like to have you guys pick in at this point and just, uh, you know, I, all I'll end with is that, that we're, we're still feeling our way. There's no grand plan here. It's just a question of showing different things we think are plausible, could develop uh, with a, a powerful European a nation, the United States of Europe, that is very heavily influenced by Americans. It's not run by them, but they do play an influential role and in how it is going about uh, doing what it can to, uh, to torpedo any further development of chattel slavery in the new world and the slave trade. Chuck, you, uh, I believe, mentioned that uh, something was different about the Dutch this time around. Yeah, that will be coming out more clearly in, uh, we are putting together an anthology of stories. We're calling it the New World Anthology, but it's actually more tightly focused than that. It, it really focused on North America. Um, and the story I'm writing for it is, is a uh, very long novella um, that I'm writing with Gorkoff and Paula Goodlett, with whom I've written a number of stories. Uh, it, it takes place what happens with the Dutch. And what happens is the Dutch in the Netherlands decide they are going to re-establish their control over the colony of the New Netherlands, which is today what's New York City and the lower part of up, upstate New York, up to Albany. Um, and for several years after the uh, uh, the Spanish reconquered the Netherlands and sorted out everything there. They basically just kind of let the Dutch colonies do their own thing, and which meant in particular West Indies companies would just basically do whatever it wanted. But they are now um, trying to reestablish control over it. And one of the things that they do is the United States of Europe puts a great deal of pressure on them 
to abolish slavery in the slave trade, to take a, for the Dutch, the, the Netherlands, to take a stance against it. Um, and the Netherlands has a vested interest in maintaining very, very good relations with the United States of Europe without forming an open alliance. They can't afford to do that because they're trying not to get in a war with Spain. Uh, and this is an issue that comes up in the book that Chuck and I just wrote, where in the new world, that, that, that expression, no peace beyond the line, comes from the Treaty of Tordesillas, where the Pope back in 15, when was it, Chuck? Do you remember that? 15, it 15, is in 14, the early 1494. Uh, no, no. Was that when the Treaty of Tordesillas? 1494. Really? Oh, I thought yeah. it was later than that. Anyway. Right the, out of the gate. Right out of the gate. <laughs> the Pope of the time sort of drew a line uh, and said, okay, uh, uh, sort of dividing a new world more or less, said everything west of it is Spanish, everything east of it is Portuguese. And theoretically, everybody is at peace, uh, but the Spanish attitude was there's no peace beyond the line. Once you cross that line and come into their territory, uh, it's war to the knife. And in practice in in the new world in the caribbean the dutch and the u.s and the usc forces have an alliance it's not formal but that's what it allows to. um but once the dutch take this position and it's reinforced by the fact that the the dutch admiral trump who is trump trump, trump. i know not trump. 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 Yeah. okay <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, he, he had brought what was left of the fleet uh, that suffered a huge defeat um, back in the second novel, 1633, uh, the Battle of Dunkirk. And anyway, he brought what was left of the fleet over the New World. And he's now the Dutch uh, naval power there. And he, for various reasons, has also come to detest slavery. So it's, also probably, a, it's probably worth mentioning that he was actually held as a slave in North Africa twice, not once, but twice. Now, granted, it was a very, very different experience, but it doesn't, the bottom line is your life is not your own. You don't know what's going to happen the next day. Uh, and I believe he was a deacon as well. So he comes at this with a whole lot of, um, of roiling attitudes that, of course, in the actual timeline, the original timeline, he had very little opportunity to do anything about, and he didn't find himself in the new world. Now, he has, he has to do things about it and has every opportunity to do so. And he's in the new world, stuck in the new world. Is the case. Yeah. Um, so that's another big change that's happening in the series is that the, the position of the Dutch is changed. There's a lot of changes that have happened. One, one change is that you don't have the big English immigration that you had in mm -hmm. real history. Uh, because just about the time it would have gotten started, the, the, the English king sold all of England's possessions in the New World to the Papist French. I'd like to thank David Weber for that. Uh, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and the, the religious dissidents in England are even less fond of the idea of having to deal with an outright Papist monarch instead of one whom they consider a crypto papist. Um, so there isn't, at least as of now, there's no big English immigration to follow on the ones that have <clears throat> happened. Um, that doesn't mean there won't be some at some point, but right now there isn't. Um, there is some Dutch immigration starting to happen because uh, the, the more hardcore Calvinists in the Dutch colonies, in the Dutch provinces, uh, the counter remonstrance is what they were called. Um, they're not at all happy with this reunited Netherlands, even though the, 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 the Spanish king, who is the official ruler of the Netherlands, has guaranteed religious freedom to everyone, which he's actually, you know, sticking to. And the, the seven Dutch provinces are, have internal autonomy. I mean, they, they basically do pretty much what they want in their internal affairs, but that doesn't matter to a lot of these people. They still don't want to have anything to do uh, and because the king is an outright papist. Um, so there is an immigration beginning for the Dutch. And that is also partly what the novella that Paul and I uh, have written will cover and the results of it, because they are going to start playing a factor in what develops in the new world. Um, 
Yeah. Walter, you touched on uh, the situation uh, uh, regarding slavery in Virginia in uh, the Atlantic encounter. Would you like to ca uh, comment on that? Well, somewhat. Um, actually, we the, the thing about Virginia is that it's sort of a uh, it's sort of a fait accompli. It's only been going on for about well, less than twenty years. Mm -hmm. What's interesting, though, is that slavery is dealt with in different ways in different colonies. Uh, we did touch upon it and its relationship with New Amsterdam, and how there are slaves in there are slaves in New Amsterdam, and that that sometimes comes as a surprise to people that there were slaves in virtually every colony until a certain point. Uh, even in Massachusetts Bay, there were call there were slaves as late as the 1750s. Uh, Virginia is an interesting situation. It's probably the wealthiest of the of the English colonies that are left over after uh, after David Weber sold them to to the, to the French. Uh, but it's just getting its feet under it now, and the idea of a of a slave based economy is just starting to get underway. Uh, a lot of people came to. Of Virginia early on as indentures. And you know, we, we've heard all about the 1619 thing. Uh, there, it isn't as, as um, embedded in, in the society as it will be in years to come. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, the USC has this excellent opportunity to try and, try and head it off and defuse it because it hasn't really gotten such a hold that it can't be un, unheld. Um, so we we more go into the politics of Virginia than we talk too much about slavery, but we do touch on it. One of the things about the, uh, keep in mind, we're in the first, third, the fourth decade of the, of the uh, 17th century. So we're still well into the first half of the 17th century. And um, Indentured, the distinction between slaves and indentured servants was was not fuzzy, but but it was a lot more porous, and let's call it that, in this period than, than it would become later. Um, the status of being a slave wasn't as locked in as it would be later. Um, and also, race attitudes were, were not what they would become later. We're, we are a lot closer to the racial attitudes of Shakespeare as expressed in Othello of Moor Venice than we are, you know, to those of the 17th and much less the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. Um, well, sure enough. Huh? Sure enough. There's not sort of you know, the whole, whole eugenic, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the race of the really hardcore, hardened racist attitudes that developed in, in uh, in the New World, especially North America, were a, a product of slavery. I mean, they were essentially a way of justifying it. Um, whereas the impression people, I don't know how to put it, but in the 17th century, people did not take Moors lightly, um, to put it mildly, uh, as we have depicted in some other novels, and there are reasons for it. Um, uh, people don't know this, most people don't know this, but this is the period in which Moors are raiding England, not the other way around, uh, and, and plundering the coast of England uh, and taking slaves, not the other way around. Uh, well, a lot, a, lot of what is, a lot of what is viewed about, about slavery, a lot of what we think about when you think about slavery, we're thinking about the chattel slavery of the 18th century where slaves are bred and their children are right. slaves. And, so, and that's, that hasn't quite gotten, it's it gotten uh, fixed yet. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Chuck should talk to, talk to that about, about the Caribbean and the, the vicious conditions in place, places like Barbados. Uh, uh, slavery is, a, is, a, is, is even more of a, a Caribbean thing than Yeah, it is. Uh, Robert, what, to, to depict some of what you depicted, or, you know, you were talking in the beginning of, of your book. Calibre's work. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine. So uh, the main character in our novel is a fellow by the name of Domingos Fernandes Calivar. He was what the Portuguese called in Brazil at the time a mameluco. He was part Portuguese, part Brazilian native. Um, he served the Portuguese in Brazil as a um, plantation owner 
and also as a, a soldier. He was a military scout and an advisor. In fact, Chuck actually introduces him originally in Commander Cantrell in the West Indies. He's up in Caribbean uh, during one portion of his novel, helping the wild geese um, as a scout uh, against their raid against the Spanish uh, um, warehouses in Puerto Cabello. Um, and so you know, we bring it back to 1634 when uh, Admiral Trump shows up in, uh, in uh, as well, what the Portuguese pronounce it is Hesife. Recife is how it's spelled. Hesife is how it's pronounced. Um, he was a, a, a strong supporter of the Portuguese, but when the Dutch show up, he switches sides. Now, nobody really knows why, or at least history hasn't a good explanation as to why, but he basically serves them the same as he did the Portu Portuguese. He serves them as a uh, plantation, uh, well, as a plantation, not as plantation owner, but as a scout and a military advisor. But he's a man trapped basically between the races. You know, he's part European, he's part uh, Brazilian native. I mean, who, 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 where does his alliances fall? You know, and it's something that he struggles with all the time. Later on in the novel, um, his family, uh, enemies of his in, in Portugal, in, in, in the captaincy of Pernambuco, basically, basically threaten his family with slavery. And then it becomes a matter with him as to what he does. Does he continue to serve the Dutch or does he do what he has to do to protect his family from that terrible uh, institution? And uh, you can imagine uh, the decision that he makes to, to do so. The kind of stuff that we depict in there is, uh, I, I felt that Chuck and I did, you know, if I may do more, I think we did a really fine job uh, depicting what it is without going overly gratuitous. I think we were very serious about it. I think we, we took a very serious and very adult and very uh, a good look at it. Uh, there are scenes where uh, they are on a slave ship. We show, uh, you know, what happens on a slave ship and how, how that occurs as Eric was describing about packing them in. Um, we also show how uh, slavery uh, was handled in a, uh, in a Spanish uh, plantation up in uh, uh, the Caribbean. Um, and we also uh, go to Cartagena, which was at the time one of the major ports and major um, hubs of the Spanish uh, slave trade in, in New Spain. And we show how uh, they were handled and how they were, uh, you know, how you know slavery and the sales were taken in on during the course of all this it's not only Calabar but it's also his wife Salia. Salia is uh, having to actually deal with this firsthand so a lot of these accounts are right through her eyes so we really see it up close and how 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 terrible and 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 and, and just socially debilitating it was personally you know whatever um Calabar has to make a decision. He makes a decision, a very favorable decision about what he's going to do with the rest of his life from here on out. It's not enough for many of the European nations, especially the Dutch, who are very supportive. Many of them are very supportive of his, of his uh, desires to end slavery. It's not enough for him to wait for the European to pow powers in his mind to decide when it's economically viable for them to do so. So he makes the decision that if this is going to be his calling, this is going to be his mission from here on out, that he's going to do what he has to do um, to bring this institution to a close. And that's the great thing about uh, uh, alternate history, right? I mean, you can right a great wrong. You know, we have an opportunity here to do, do it much, much better than it you know, in the real world. <laughs> so you know, that, that's what we do. Like spin, I'd like to spin a reverse off that, which is the, um, which shows up in No Peace Beyond the Line, or let's just say it, let me throw this out there. Je the series right now has looked at technological advance and it's, it's you know, one, one of the things I love best about working in this alternate history is so many you know, it's an AK-47 goes back in time or the combustion engine and this is what changes it. What I like about this series is that it is the library which changes things. And boy, does it change things. And one of the things, let's say, that I would recommend people keep their eyes out at the end of No People on the Line. You know, there, there are all sorts of people who are learning lessons from history. And not all of them are nice people. And all the things we're taught, you know, think back on the number of times just in the past, I think it's 40 minutes or so, 
that there's been a, a contrast made between what the institution that slavery developed into in the course of the 18th and then the 19th centuries compared to now, and it would become entirely different, except for there are records of that, the very detailed records of that. And for some people, that's horror. But for people with, shall we say, low enough moral and ethical standards, that might be considered a business model. <laughs> Ooh, that's creepy, Chuck. That's good. I like that. <laughs> Uh, well, he's thinking of some characters in particular whom oh, yes. we yes. developed in, in No Peace Beyond the Line and whom we leave at the end of it off on adventures mm -hmm. of their own, um, which will then intersect with some not very attractive characters in the novella I've written going off on yep. adventures of their own. Um, yeah, this is not one sided. I mean, this is <laughs> not at all one sided. There are people on both sides. Uh, and um, yeah, and the other guy gets to connive too. Um, the one, there are some things, yeah. yeah, there are some some things though. What, 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 from my point of view as a storyteller is makes this whole thing fascinating is that because this is, you know, this is not alternate fantasy. This is alternate history, and we have to keep it plausible and realistic. You know, it can't just be, you know, waving a magic wand. And the reality of it is that there is there are only so many resources that a great power like the United States of Europe is going to put into this because it has no big immediate interest of its own involved. Um, so. Anybody who wants to tackle the issue of slavery and the slave trade is not going to have fleets at their disposal. Let's put it that way. Um, they might have the alliance of some ships for a bit, but you know, they're, they're, it's not going to be that easy. On the other hand, they do have some things working in their favor. And the single most important is what Chuck just talked about which is what he calls the library. What he means by that is that it took two centuries. I, I talk about it actually in a different series I'm writing, uh, uh, the, the Sam Houston series I'm doing, also called The Trail of Glory, um, where I'm picking up the anti-slavery efforts in England much later in time, in the 19th century. Uh, in real history, it was very late before any organized effort to combat slavery got started. Um, not until the 18th century, um, and pretty late in the 18th century at that. Whereas here, you've got a group of people, including uh, Granville, in, in, in the town of Granville, it's a West Virginia town, which means that it's overwhelmingly white. But um, there is an African American population there. It's not a large one, but it exists. And and there are other people who, although they're not themselves African Americans, who care a great deal about this issue. So the point is, they get a head start on this right away because they know what's coming and what the issue is. And so just the fact that you have an anti-slavery league get organized in the 1630s instead of having to wait a century and a half will make a hell of a difference because they're getting a head start on it. Um, and so far the series hasn't touched much on that, but it is going to start appearing more. And uh, I've started uh, working with uh, Walt Boys, another uh, author. We're start just starting the process of figuring out storylines that will actually hit Africa and take place in Africa. So far, the 1632 series has had very little contact uh, with Africa, but uh, that will be changing. And this period in history happens to be a very fascinating one in African history, too. Yeah, it's almost like you have a background in this particular period, huh? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, what I studied when I was planning to become a Half a century ago now, I was planning to become a, uh, a university professor and what I was studying was African history. Although what I was specializing in was, was South Central and Eastern African history, not West Africa. And that part of Africa was not basically affected by, there was slavery there and it was a certain kind of slave trade, but it wasn't, East Africa wasn't affected by what was happening in, uh, in the New World. 
But for instance, you have at this same time period, she's alive and in the prime of her power, you have a warrior queen in Angola named Mzingo, who's just an absolutely fascinating character. Um, you had some powerful kingdoms just <clears throat> beginning to emerge along the coast. You have the great medieval empires of the Sahel, the empires of, of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, they've all collapsed by now. But who's to say somebody couldn't research something? Um, so this, this whole period in history is fascinating just about everywhere in the world, for truth of it. It's part of the reason why this is a great place to do all their history. Um, but we will be talking more about that. What, what we've done so far, and this is partly cunning planning, but a lot of it's just because the way it is, um, is we've, we haven't had some great overarching scheme for how to develop this theme. It's just been emerging as we write stories and things that look like, yeah, this would make a good story and it makes sense. And we have an overall framework we're approaching it in, but we're sort of into a very real sense we're feeling our way ourselves and uh, as storytellers. And that's what our, our characters are doing too. Um, and I think it makes for, I think it makes for really good stories. I hope the readers uh, agree with us. Uh, so far they seem to by and large, not everybody. You know. You get the occasional negative review on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you know of such things, Eric. Uh, I, <clears throat> I occasionally will, I, I tell people, don't read reviews, uh, which is excellent advice on my part. I tend to break it simply because I really have a rhinoceros hide. So, but what I'll do is I'll scan. I won't spend a lot of time. I just am kind of curious to see what kind of scenes might be emerging. And uh, um, look, almost all these books in this series, and this series is now up to 25 novels, and, and more than that, to include all the new titles the Ring of Fire Press is coming out with. Typical novel maintains four, four and a half star reviews on Amazon over a period of years. and and. Given how many, uh, I don't want to say outright trolls, but um, 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 troglodytes at any rate, um, there are floating around writing Amazon reviews. Uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, especially when you get a lot of reviews too. It's not just, you know, your five best friends are reviewing you. Um, you know, 1632, I just noticed it's this close to getting a thousand reviews. It's, I think we're up to 990 something. I'll get right on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See if I can anticipate a uh, uh, question from some of the, the members of the con. Um, what reasons are there for not just outright abolishing slavery right now? What makes that difficult? Well, abolishing it where? Respect. <laughs> it, in, in the Americas. Well, but who's going to do it? I mean, mm -hmm. they, we, okay, first of all, the United States of Europe has no colonies in the New World at all. Um, and they are not planning to create it. Now, that's not to say some citizens of the United States of Europe might not go and do it on their own because they're not going to pol police it either. But, um, but they're not giving any backing to any settlements of their own, although they will be <laughs> establishing some military. Um, installations of various places for strategic reasons, but those are going to be in the Caribbean and Gulf Coast area. Um, so the USC, can, actually I believe the USC, I'm not even sure we would specified this, but the USC I'm sure has in its constitution that slavery is illegal. So it's already abolished it, but nobody in New World cares. Um, the Dutch are on the verge of doing it. That will be coming up in the, in the, they, it hadn't yet happened, but they are going to do it. Um, that's because they um, don't, well, it, it's a trickier thing. The, the, the Dutch king is going to do it, but that doesn't mean the West India Company and the people actually running the show on this or that island in the Caribbean are gonna pay any attention to what he says or doesn't say. Um, but nonetheless, it's important that that formal stance will be taken. Um, other than that, it's up to whoever's there and what you do. And it's, it's very much, um, it's kind of part of the slogan, no peace beyond the line. There there's really is no peace beyond the line. And that means there's also not much law beyond the line either. 
unless you're directly under the control of one of the, you know, Spain or, or you know. Yeah, or, I, I mean, just just the the word abolish is essentially it's a, it's a term that that has juridical roots, mm -hmm. and there is no there is no central power that is able to even think of doing that. And look what look look you know we wanted to do it in this country. And, and as Eric said, we fought not just the bloodiest war, but I think still the casualty count of all other wars has still not exceeded that. Of the, of the uh, there are probably haven't. They're close, but, but yeah. yeah. They're, they're getting really close, but at, no, no, you're right. a lot of catching up to do, I guess you could say. And, <laughs> and so who's going, to, who's going to do it? How would it be enforced? And, you know, who would who'd be in the room? Um, and plus, the other problem is we are in the 17th century. Um, uh, the, the, we do not have unmanned drones flying all over the place, hmm. overseeing things. Um, and the world is a really, really, really big place. It's, it's um, human beings tend to forget just how huge the planet is compared to us. And, and the best way I've ever found to sort of try to make that clear to people is that if you shrink, because we think these enormous mountains and huge oceans and deep trenches in the oceans and big rivers and yeah, yeah, yeah. If you took the planet and shrunk it to the size of a billiard ball, it would be smoother than a billiard ball. That's how huge this planet is that, that when you expand it out to its full size, 8,000 miles across and a 25,000 mile circumference, it looks really, that's because we're just tiny, tiny little critters. So the point is, you can have colonies set up, slave plantations set up, all kinds of things happening all over that people don't even know about, or that some people know about, but you know, it, trying to even find it, much less police, it's not that easy. And, and oceans are big. And oceans are really, really, really big. And really dangerous in this era. Yeah. Oh. Um, so it's, it's not going to be a quick, easy process, but, um, but even given that, that, that the, the, our heroes and heroines in this who are attempting to put an end to this um, do have some forces at their disposal, but they still don't have a whole lot. Um, so it's going to be a struggle, um, which I hate, I have, I mean, I, you know, I, I hate, I have to admit, from the point of view of storyteller, struggles are great, you know? I mean, you don't really want things to be easy because that doesn't really make for a good story. Um, I, I mean, I don't want to come right out and say you wish ill on your characters. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> but why not? You know, why you know it, it, it happens, um, and 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 you know, so it's gonna. They, they, these are gonna be a lot of stories, <coughs> and a lot of good ones. I think. Um, um, we've got a few minutes left. Uh, do, yeah. Was, uh, oh, that's right. We started. <coughs> Sorry, I'm I'm used to starting at the hour now. Um, So right now, what's coming up, just to re recap, uh, recapitulate, um, the, Chuck, the book Chuck and I finished just recently, 1637, No Peace Beyond Line, that'll be coming out in November, and that will touch on a lot of these issues. Uh, the issue of slavery is very important in that novel, more than it was in the first one, uh, Commander Cantrell in the West Indies. Um, the next book coming out will be Robert and, and Chuck's uh, Calabar's War. Uh, which comes out in um, uh, April. The next one takes us in a completely different, uh, which is coming out the next month in May. That's uh, 1637, The Peacock Throne, which I'm in the process of finishing uh, with, with Griff Barber. And, and now that takes us to the Mughal Empire, literally, literally on the other side of the world, uh, in India. Um, and after that, we will have um, uh, the Grantville Gazette 9 collection of short fiction is scheduled to be published in July of next year. And after that, I'm not sure. We do have the um, 
the New World Anthology that's very close to being put together. Um, so I'm not quite sure when we will return back to the New World in terms of at least one of the, you know, novels published by Bain Books. There, there may well be shorter stories that uh, either come out in an anthology published by Bain or more likely might get published by Ring of Fire Press. Um, uh, but this will be an ongoing continuing theme from here on in in the series. It's, uh, it's been popping in and out for quite a while now. And from here on in, I think anything that touches the Western Hemisphere is going to take this issue up because it's going to happen. Um, am I overlook, uh, I'm trying to think if I'm missing something. I'm, I'm going to leave it up to you guys. Figure out okay. what I what I what, what stitch I dropped. If we I, had lots of stories left to tell in the new world. Yeah, I know we do. I know we do. Uh, well, I mean, part of it we haven't even talked about another whole issue, which is relations between Europeans and the native settlers, Native Americans of the region. Uh, we did have a panel on that subject elsewhere in a convention. Uh, yeah, we, we touch on it in Atlantic and too. Hmm? In Atlantic Encounter, we certainly touch on it. Yeah, no, that. we do an Atlantic Encounter, which came out yeah. in June. Um, but the, the, they all get mixed together because, um, well, they did in the real world. They're going to get even more mixed together in this one. Yep. Uh, okay. Final of, thoughts, Walter? Um, what a fun universe to write in. And, uh, I'm looking <laughs> for, and I'm looking forward to writing more. We're going to do France. We're going to do North America. We're going to do uh, lots of happy stuff. And uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Robert? I second uh, Walter's comments, but I also think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually quite happy that we are finally uh, getting around to dealing with this issue of slavery in the new world. It's an issue that has to be addressed, and I think we're approaching it very well. I, I do need to, to tell people, though, that I have... Uh, uh, I don't want to use the word Shanghai because I think I'd probably get in trouble now. But um, um, I have dragooned Robert, and and he is now actually working with me on a on a different novel altogether, <laughs> which, which will be taking place in Transylvania. Uh, very far. Oh yeah, it's going to um, be a blast. That one will be a lot of fun. But yeah. uh, I I think uh, well, the next one Walter and I are going to do it takes place in France and. In France, yes. And the next one that Chuck and I are going to do takes place in the Mediterranean. So um, nobody stays in one place for all that long forever. Um, right. Anyway. Chuck, final thoughts? Um, yeah, a couple. Uh, as, as Eric said, the next one uh, that I'm going to do with him is one that uh, it's it's been, there's a showdown coming and it's been building for a while and it will bring, I think, a lot of, uh, a lot of threads that have it, there's a there's a sort of um, th there's a sort of a sine wave uh, I, I think effect where where people Grantville and and the people connected to it either either from downtimers or uptimers yeah. sort of spread out and then I think we're seeing a lot in in this this next novel that Eric and I are going to do there's a return of a lot of core characters and a lot of core threads to the same geographic region. And that's been, uh, it's been a while since that's happened. And I just want to also lastly say that uh, I, I, I can't underscore enough uh, what Robert and Eric have said about the care with which this was handled. Um, this is, uh, this was, uh, you know, at, at, at some level, this is a, this is a thing that, that you kind of look around and you say, somebody's got to do it. I'm not sure we're the right people to do it, but, but the bottom line is this story had to be told. And the, the, the number of times we went back and forth, because you can't have a, even if you don't have any romance in a novel and they're really, there's, there's, there's family, there, there's what I would call family romance, but the idea of courtship is really not something that, plays well with any sort of serious notion of slavery. And, and yet sexual politics are there. And so much of the, of the horrors of slavery were related not merely to physical, but, but well, as, as you know, sexual violence is violence. And slavery was, was rife with that, obviously. Um, and there was no step where we took 
where if there was going to be a scene that had that component in it, uh, I'd be on the phone with Eric or I'd get, or, or I'd trade an email with Robert and say, are we doing the right thing here? You know, we, we, this more important than anything else, we didn't want the novel to be, to be, how can I put it? Um, it, 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 it didn't want to have, it, it didn't want to be a, a, a matte finish. It wanted to be able to have life and vigor, but it not, not with sensationalism. There was going to be no sensationalism of any part of this. And that was something that we all took really seriously and spent a lot of time doing. So uh, I want to say that uh, I don't know that I'm particularly, you know, I, I can't pat myself on the back, but I know that uh, I know very much that Robert was a great steward of that, and so was Eric. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I think that brings us to the end of the panel. Yeah, we're out of time. And uh, please see us in the wrap-up session at the end of the day. Yes. Um, yes, we will be having one um, at the end of this day, and uh, people can come and bring it up. If they have questions, that's, that's the one place we could do question and answers. We thought about trying to do them with each panel, but um, this is already a very ambitious program we put together, and trying to do that would have been probably two bridges too far. Um, but there will be one uh, session, and it's open ended, it's at the end of the day, so there's no set necessary time limit. Okay, thank right. you for coming. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yep. All right.